Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. All of us with the Abolition Collaboratory welcome you to our inaugural event, Abolition, Activism, and the University, Practitioner Perspectives on Transformative Justice in Boston. This event would not be possible without the phenomenal support of collaborating organizations, namely the Mindich Program and Engaged Scholarship, Mahindra Humanities Center, the Charles Warren Center, Royal House and Slave Quarters, Phillips Brooks House Association, the Transformative Justice Initiative and the Prison Studies Project. And a special thanks to our thought partners, Bench Ansfield and Kira Singleton, who hosted the amazing Abolitionist in Action Zoom webinar last month. My name is Anissa Medina, and I'm one of the undergraduate fellows at the Abolition Collaboratory. I'm a junior at the college with a joint concentration in history and literature and the study of religion, focusing on how colonial conflicts are memorialized in local and national histories. The Abolition Collaboratory or AbCollab is an inclusive working group, wayfinding space and meeting house for students, faculty, staff and activists. We're housed within the Mindich Program and Engaged Scholarship, and our collective vision is to advance abolition studies and uplift community-engaged social justice work within and beyond the university. On our website, which Mary has kindly posted in the chat, you can find information about Cambridge and Boston area abolitionists in action, in addition to abolitionist funding opportunities like the Just Inquiry Initiative, as well as upcoming events and courses offered at Harvard focused on abolition. The Ab Collab was born out of a desire to combat the university's past and present tendency to isolate and undermine abolitionist projects in siloed schools or departments. And so the Abolition Collaboratory instead fosters cross school collaboration centered on prison industrial complex or PIC abolition in ways that transcend university walls and transgress dominant scholarly practices and challenge epistemic colonialism. And so we hope that you find this community effort fruitful, inspirational, and honest as the national and global struggles to end predatory policing and mass incarceration gain traction. And so now I will pass it over to Isabel, our other AbCollab undergraduate fellow, to introduce today's amazing guest panelists. Thank you, Anissa, for that opening statement. Um, I've been so lucky to work with uh, Anissa over the course of this year at the Abca Lab. Uh, my name is Isabel Levin, and I'm also a fellow at the Abolition Collaboratory. Uh, I'm a junior at Harvard College studying social studies uh, with a particular focus on 911 and the emergency response system, uh, specifically the way that it uh, perpetuates racist outcomes. Uh, today, we are fortunate enough to have Mrs. Andrea C. James, Dr. Beth Wally, Eli Patterson, and Derricka Purnell here to speak with us. Mrs. Andrea James is the founder and executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, and the founder of Families for Justice's Healing. She's the author of Upper Bunkies Unite and Other Thoughts on the Politics of Mass Incarceration, a 2015 Soros Justice Fellow, as well as a recipient of the 2016 Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award. As a former criminal defense attorney and a formerly incarcerated woman, Andrea shares her personal and professional experiences to raise awareness of the efforts of incarcerating women on themselves, their children, and communities. Her work is focused on ending incarceration of women and girls and contributing to the shift from a criminal legal system focused on police and prisons to a system led by directly affected people from within their neighborhoods and based on individual and community accountability. Dr. Beth Wally is an assistant professor of sociology at Framingham State University and is part of the Building Up People Not Prisons Coalition. The coalition represents incarcerated people, formerly incarcerated people, women and families from the most incarcerated neighborhoods in Massachusetts and allies from across the Commonwealth. Elijah Patterson is a disabled queer activist and abolitionist on Massachusetts and Wampanoag land. Eli has bachelor's degrees in English literature and secondary education, and has completed coursework for a master's in gender and cultural studies. They entered into abolition by reading letters from incarcerated queer people across the US and now coordinate Black and Pink Massachusetts pen pal program to connect people across barbed wire. 
While Eli's whiteness has insulated them against incarceration, experience with court involvement and coercive and forced confinement in psychiatric facilities have informed a deep commitment to all those pine lock doors. Derricka Purnell is the author of Becoming Abolitionists. Becoming Abolitionists shows that abolition is not solely about getting rid of police, but a commitment to create and support different answers to the problem of harm in society, and most excitingly, an opportunity to reduce and eliminate harm in the first place. She received her JD from Harvard Law School, her BA from the University of Missouri, Kansas, and studied public policy and economics at the University of California, Berkeley, as a public policy and international affairs law fellow. Her writing has been published widely, including in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Boston Review, Teen Vogue, and Harper's Bazaar. She's currently a columnist at The Guardian, a Margaret Burroughs Fellow for the Social Justice Initiatives Portal Project at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and a scholar in residence at Columbia Law School. Our moderator for today's discussion is also a member of the uh, Abolition Collaboratory. Deanza Cook is a PhD candidate and presidential scholar in the history department at Harvard University. Her dissertation traces the evolution of urban police science, police business, and police reform in America at the dawn of the 21st century. At Harvard, Danza serves as a resident tutor at Cabot House and as an engaged scholarship fellow with the Abolition Collaboratory. In addition to her doctoral work, Danza administers seminar courses for law enforcement officers in her home state of Virginia. She also teaches an African-American history course for incarcerated students at MCI Norfolk. Thank you again to our guests for being here. We are so honored that you made the time to be with us today. And now I'd like to pass it off to Danza. Thank you, Isabel, for those wonderful introductions. And thank you all for tuning in with us this afternoon. It is truly a delight to be present with each and every one of you today and to dive deeper into some of the most urgent questions of our lifetimes. We've assembled this all-star panel this afternoon because these folks are already in the trenches doing the work of transforming systems and transforming lives. Three of our speakers today are already close collaborators, actively engaged in ongoing movements to end mass human caging right here in Massachusetts. And all of our speakers today are fighting against predatory policing practices across America. As Anissa mentioned earlier, the purpose of this virtual convening is to confront crucial contradictions and challenges inherent within the university with respect to abolition and activism. And to do that, it's very important that we acknowledge the past and present complicity that Harvard University and other universities have in perpetuating many of the very same problems in this country that we will be discussing today, including mass criminalization, state violence and interpersonal violence, racist and heterosexist policing, and premature death by incarceration, which are all indeed legacies of slavery. To provide a quick roadmap of our discussion this afternoon, for the next half hour, we'll kick off our conversation with some prepared questions submitted by student organizers. Then after that, we'll open it up to audience questions for the remainder of our time together. At any point during our discussion today, please feel free to write your questions using the Q&A tool function, which should be visible on your screen. And with that, we'll get started. And I'd like to ask our panelists to please uh, turn on your cameras, if you may. So we have about 140 folks uh, listening in with us this afternoon. So it's safe to assume that not everybody has a shared understanding of what abolition means and how to distinguish abolition from reform. So to give everybody a sense of what abolition means to you all, how would you answer the question, what is abolition? And how does your understanding of abolition apply to the work that you do? You asked a tough one right out the gate, but I was briefly a teacher and I can't handle what's called hang time after a question. Um, so I guess that I'll start with my own sort of imperfect definition of abolition, which has to do with 
creating the world in which we have the ability and the desire to respond to harm meaningfully without creating further harm. And I regard abolition as both the road that we're taking to get to the goal and the goal itself. Um, I think that abolition is essential to building a different kind of world where we um, can treat one another and meet one another as uh, truly equal individuals. Um, and I think that so many problems in society would be addressed through abolition and must necessarily be addressed through that path to abolition. So I think that's kind of my starting place. Thank you for kicking us off, Eli. Other thoughts? Well, I think for us, um, abolition is uh, the, the simple way of, uh, and, uh, and picking up also on what our comrade Eli has, has kicked us off with. For us, uh, how we define abolition based on the work that we do is really what different looks like. So as I'm sitting talking to you right now, uh, there's, there's helicopters flying over my house. I live in Roxbury, in a house that my family has been in for five generations. And we live in the most incarcerated corridor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And when we hear helicopters over our heads, um, we just lost three young black men in the past couple of weeks. Another one was shot a week ago. Um, it usually is indicating that there's been a shooting in our neighborhood. So um, I hope that it doesn't uh, end in the way that it's ended in the last uh, four uh, shootings in the past couple of weeks, but it's right over my house right now. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but for us, uh, abolition means what different looks like. How do we uh, begin not to wait um, for systems to dismantle themselves, but how do we start right where we are and take those steps as people living within our neighborhoods to create um, what different looks like? How do we begin to rebuild, repair the economic and familial disruption that our families and our people have gone through in neighborhoods like mine, where in every single household, including my own, um, um, not just myself, but my husband as well, are, are formerly incarcerated people. And what has that done to our communities and to our neighborhood? And really just being creative, being creative um, and building in community so that we can create what different looks like. Yeah, I can jump in after Andrea, if that's okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. For I want to be a big shout out to my homegirl. Yay, Dara, <laughs> nice seeing you. Nice seeing you too. Nice seeing you too. And I'm so happy that you started your answer with for us, right? Meaning for your organization, because I can give like a lot of technical definitions of abolition, but all of those definitions I've come to understand were really rooted in struggle and in organizations, right? Like critical resistance, when they came to their definition of abolishing the prison industrial complex, that didn't happen because one person sat down and just defined abolition, right? There were arguments and debates about what they meant when they said, we need to abolish the prison industrial complex. So sometimes when we hear a definition or we see or read a definition, it ignores the fights and the struggles that it took to get there. And I'm experiencing that right now with a political home, one of my political homes. We were going back and forth um, for a couple of weeks over this term working class. And then we realized that we didn't have a shared definition of working class. And then we needed to build some shared definition that was then going to inform our organizing work. And so when I say abolition, it really depends on the kinds of people I'm organizing with and, the, and what's informing that struggle. So my general understanding of abolition is a commitment to eradicating capitalist, carceral, community-based, colonial violence at the same time over time until we get to a place where we get to unveil better problems, better things to fight over it. Right, uh, that's coming from people like Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Rachel Herzing and Mariam Kava, right? So I, again, like it's easy to pull on these people and draw on these people, but even their definitions or understandings of abolition were created by communities. 
Um, I also think of police abolition specifically as a way to reduce our reliance on police, reduce the reasons why people think they need police, reduce the reasons why people need police, right? All, how we're relating to this, this project of policing as a smaller part of the prison industrial complex. So how do we reduce and eliminate and prevent harm? And how do we build responses that to harm and then also build ways that prevent harm? There are lots of ways that they show up. And so I think that before, I would probably say that there's so many different things that we can all do that's abolitionist. And I think that's absolutely true. And I think about one specific campaign that I'm working on right now, which is around student debt cancellation. Student debt cancellation generally doesn't have to be related to abolition, but the people who I'm organizing this campaign with are doing it through an abolitionist framework because we see student debt as a way that people lose agency is how they don't make decisions over what kind of lives to live, what kind of partners to have, if they decide to have children, right? If they're going to decide to take a corporate job versus a job for public interest. And what does that do? It helps to further capitalist violence. It helps to submit private property relationships. And so I think about the particular campaigns that I'm working on with other people, and then that informs the kinds of definitions that we use to get free, right? And so um, I'm grateful for people who, who decide to do that together because that's, that's how you learn and that's also how you practice it. Love that. I'll jump in. Thank you so much. And thank you. It's such an honor to be on this panel. Um, and I totally agree with all the other panelists and their um, assessments of abolition. I think what I have to add is what I love um, about volunteering for people, not prisons, the organize, the volunteer organization underneath um, Families for Justice is Healing is that Families for Justice is Healing organization that Andrea founded um, is doing that work at the same time, right? So it's like abolition, people here, you know, removing these structures, but let's actually build up those other structures in the community at the same time. So some of those things like the hydroponic farm that Families for Justice is Healing is doing and the um, guaranteed income that, um, that they're also doing, right? Like how do we build up the community while dismantling the harm has been some of the most amazing parts of the application of abolition um, for me. Thanks. Thank you all. That was a very thorough explication of how we can envision abolition in community and that uh, definitions that are rooted in the struggles that we're actively engaged in. Um, so I wanna move to a question that helps us understand kind of abolition and its convergences, but also divergences with transformative justice. Um, because as you mentioned, Derica, um, one of our panelists for our sister event, Abolitionists in, Ac in Action, was Miriam Kaba. Um, and she made a very powerful and important distinction between abolitionist work and transformative justice practice. Um, and in particular, she wanted to you know, impress on, upon us that uh, folks who are doing transformative justice or TJ work um, are operating outside and beyond kind of state controlled institutions, most importantly, police and prisons. Um, so what kind of clear distinctions do you all make um, when you're doing abolition or transformative justice work? Like how do you kind of distinguish between the two? Um, do they overlap for you? Uh, do, or do you see yourself kind of doing this work simultaneously? I will defer to the TJ people on the call to take this question on. Uh -huh. So, um, and, and, you know, I am a student of Mariam Cup <laughs> and um, uh, always um, learning and listening. And I read this question and I struggled with it a little bit, but I could hear Mariam's voice uh, uh, talking about the practice of TJ, um, but also for us, for us. Um, as people who are still learning and always in struggle and trying to figure out these processes that we can incorporate into what we refer to as abolitionist work. Um, for us, we've, it's, been, it's been part of the same. And I, um, I can only speak for us and where we are in our evolution of learning um, because we, in our abolitionist work have stepped out and created after two and a half years of listening tours of, of women and movement family in the most in, uh, communities most entangled in the criminal legal system, 
coming up with our buckets of work and, 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 and envisioning what different looks like and dumping all that information from those long conversations in prisons and long conversations in communities. And one of those buckets is transformative justice that we consider part of our abolitionist work. And for, for us, it's about how do you create, one, take the indictment off of the individual while also creating individual accountability that's actually meaningful, unlike the accountability that I was uh, subjected to, which was incarceration, which only caused further harm. Um, and also though, bringing into that incorporating community accountability, which doesn't happen at all. And so as we grapple with and struggle with and try and create transformative justice circles and ways to think about doing this work through a TJ practice, which is very challenging. If you're really on the ground doing this, particularly in communities like mine, where we know people cause harm, egregious harm sometimes, and will cause harm again um, if, if that opportunity arises. I mean, it's, re it's, it's a real struggle sometimes. Um, but working through the practice of what we're learning, still learning about transformative justice to help us to create what we envision through what different looks like through our lens of abolition, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and I want to just go ahead, Eli. Yeah, I want to pick up on that idea of harm and how important it's been, you know, for my evolution to recognize that we all create harm. We all create harm. Um, we create different kinds of harm, um, but the ways in which people are held quote accountable for harm um, are very white supremacist, sexist, trans misogynist. Um, so I really believe that no one is more committed to accountability than abolitionists, certainly not the carceral system, because what we're looking for is what actually caused the transgression and how the entire system around and within a person um, caused that to happen and how we fix that for the future. And I don't, I don't really say that I do transformative justice work, but I, um, because I don't feel like that's where my skill set lies, but it's definitely half of the definition of that I work with with, with abolition. Yeah, for me, um, I would also say that I thought I read this question was like, oh, interesting. So I'm not surprised to hear that it was Miriam Kaba making me think again. <laughs> I love that. Um, so I would say. I like thinking about abolition and TJ as separate in this way, because as we are taking something apart, we are building something back up together. And so thinking about, I love the conversation about accountability so far, thinking about that as our method of accountability. And when I um, am part of People Not Prisons, we talk about this when we're knocking doors on the streets. And I talk about this in the classroom um, here at Framingham State too people aren't really held accountable in prison, right? When nobody's really held accountable for their harm when we're centering victims there, right? Where are, what are the victim needs and how are they being met and how are they not being met? And that's what I think is super exciting about transformative justice is that you can focus right in on what do the people who experience harm need in that moment? And it's rarely a cage, right? It is a whole lot of things and it's not a cage. And so I think it's a super important way to think about the relationship between abolition and transformative justice is that we've all been disappointed by the ways that harm has been addressed that we've experienced. And we've all also, just as Eli was saying, we've all harmed people and not been held accountable to it. And so how do we actually address that harm in a way that it then improves society and makes less harm to have to address in the first place? Thanks. Fantastic. I think all of that made sense and beautifully, I think, illustrates kind of the diversity of responses um, that we're all still learning. I really love this emphasis on continual learning and also learning with the communities that we're working with, um, because it's such an important piece um, that actually feeds into our next question about political education. Um, so to give us a deeper understanding of kind of the values 
uh, that inspire the work that you guys do. Can we just talk a little bit more about your political education? We have a question from Dharma Seda Gonzalez, who is a student member of the Cabot Prison Abolition Book Club. And she asks, how did your political education journey begin? Are there specific lineages, homes, historical movements or movement figures that keep you rooted in your abolitionist work? And feel free to take it away, Derica, if you wanna chime in on this one. Yeah, sorry, I was thinking about, <laughs> I was thinking about um, Denzel acting as Malcolm X. I was like, when was the first time I was like politicized? <laughs> And I like get to this scene. Um, sorry, um, that's where I was sort of drifting off to. I think that the easiest way for me to start this actually to start with movies like Malcolm X and conversations I had early in my home, where I feel very lucky that I was introduced to a lot of Black revolutionary figures as a child, right? I mean, it's something that came up regularly in conversations. You know, some of my earliest memories were watching my uncle and my mom cry in my grandmother's living room because of the speeches that were taking place at the Million Man March. And even though they didn't agree with all of the speeches, they were just so moved by the, the display that was happening in DC. And, you know, I, I feel very, very lucky. Actually, one thing I, I've spoken about before is how I don't know if that happens. I don't know to the extent that happens in other children's households, but I feel very lucky that it happened in mine and I watched it happen over time, over time and over time. And then by the time I would say I, um was in college I did, wouldn't use the word political education but when I was a freshman sophomore in college I was a pretty conservative Christian and I remember I talk about this a little bit in the book but I remember being frustrated for going to class you know I was studying econ I was studying black studies I was studying political science and I was learning about inequality and capitalism and racism that, that explained why Black people were poor. And I was going to church and I was being taught that Black people were poor because they weren't tithing, because they weren't faithful, because they didn't believe in God, really. And so I remember struggling like between both. And I shared that with a pastor that I was close with, and he encouraged me to change my major. Um, he said, you know, this is making you doubt your religion, you should change your major. And I was too much of an Aries to even get, get that kind of feedback from him. And so I was very, very, very upset. I had a conversation with someone who I thought to be like a Christian, but cared about social justice in the way that I did. And I was like, hey, how are you Black and Christian? This doesn't even make sense. And we basically got into this, this conversation about different traditions of Christianity. So this is the, the first time I'm learning the difference between history and tradition, right? He said, well, you know, there's different kinds of Christians. There's like T.D. Jakes Christian, there's like Creflo Dollar Christians, there's Nat Turner Christians, there's like Harriet Tubman Christians, there's Jeremiah Wright Christians. And so I was just shocked because in my head, these were all kind of the same people. And then you go and you listen to their sermons and one is critiquing empire and white supremacy, right? And economic and war and imperialism. And you're like, oh, this, this I, I like can sort of get down with. This is what I'm kind of excited about. And then find myself moving closer and closer and closer to like people who are in that tradition, right? Who use Christianity as a way to talk about justice and freedom, you know, for all people, love for all people in a way that was serious. Um, and not mushy in a way that I haven't taught before. So by the time I got to law school, um, I actually went to a panel, I think it was at Harvard, but I think it was Charles Warren Center, um, and Robin Kelly was there, um, Jamala Rogers, who's from St. Louis, Percy Green, who's from St. Louis, George Lipsitz, who's written extensively about St. Louis, they're all on this panel. And Robin D.G. Kelly starts talking about political education. And I was like, what is this person talking about? Like, I was, so I raised my hand, I was like, what should I read for my political education? And he goes, I can't tell you what to read for your political education. You have to figure that out with the people you're organizing with. And I was like, what kind of academic non-answer is that? The same impulse, I was like, this man is wild. I had no idea who this guy was. It was just was like, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like this. But he was so right. And in being, you know, in continuing to organize and going to South Africa, learning, watching students who were reading and debating 
and using those political texts to then inform their demands, I was like, oh, that's what Rodney Kelly meant last month by political education. What sorts of texts, what sorts of readings, materials, music, film, art are you using to help you understand the difference between history and tradition? And that's gonna help situate you for the tradition that you're in to fight for freedom. And so that, like the conversations I had earlier with my friend with JP around Christianity, and then the later conversations with Robin, then the later conversations with student activists from different parts of the world really helped flourish my understanding of political education. And it's something that's integral to the lawyering and the organizing, the writing that I do today. And which is why in my earlier comments, like we were all saying working class in my political home, then we realized like, oh, we mean different things. We should read about this. We should talk about which traditions that we're in. Is this the term that we want to use for the fight that we're trying to wage? Like, how do we identify? You know, so it, those sorts of conversations that's informed and critical and require lots of fighting, but also lots of clarity um, that help us think about how to get free. That was a beautiful summary. Other folks want to build upon that and tell us about some of your political education ex educational experiences. Well, mine's very fast, so I'll go fast. Uh, reading Angela Davis in college <laughs> is what did that. Um, that really started me off um, just thinking about things that I've been thinking for a long time about the um, inherent inhumanity in putting people in cages. Um, and Angela Davis really brought it together in terms of thinking about that um, in intersectionally and in intersectionality of struggles. That was hugely radicalizing for me. Um, and then I got around some abolitionist organizers who were working with women inside in Colorado where I went to grad school. And they um, created space to teach me and I got guided and mentored and space to mess up. So that was important, right? Getting people around you who are going to hear you out and your awful questions that 10 years later, you'll be like, I can't believe I asked these questions um, and, and really guided me along the way. So finding yourself um, mentorship and doing the reading. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I'm really underread. Um, my disabilities make it hard to like ask, reading a book is asking a lot of me. Um, so I take in what I can. I follow all of you on Twitter. Um, I read religiously. I read every article that I post, which I think is not common praxis, but um, just taking in the bites as much as I can and then having conversations with people who know more than I do, which in particular means formerly incarcerated people because I'm not formally incarcerated. And there's just things that I would never understand unless that happens to me. Um, and so they're, they're who really helped shape my perspective. Andrea has been such a huge, I've learned so much from being in spaces with, with her. Um, that they just a lot of my my understanding my praxis uh, comes from working directly with other groups and communities and people. Um, I thank you, and um, I think that's the beauty of the collective that we have and share is that we are student teachers all the time. And we have learned so much. I cannot tell you how much I needed to and have learned uh, from Eli um, um, and continue to learn. Um, and I appreciate all that they pour into um, being a part of our student teacher collective and, and Beth as well. These are people that I work with every single day and cherish uh, those relationships. I think for, for me personally, I was, um, you know, I was raised into a black formally, I mean, a, a, a abolitionist family who didn't use that term, but all of their actions were because of the struggle that they went through to define how they wanted to live their lives. And, um, so in three phases quickly, um, my family, my parents were 
educator activist. They uh, traveled the world doing research of people of African diaspora. And as children, we got to travel to countries in Africa and the Caribbean and learn about the struggle of Black people in that way. Um, and uh, then uh, when I was in college, I'm, I'm older. I was born in 1964, uh, but when I was in college, I was the um, uh, deeply involved in the work as a director of the Black Student Center at the University of Massachusetts, where I went to college. And, th and during that time, Rodney King was beaten um, by the Los Angeles Police Department. And um, I remember um, feeling personally more so than ever a time in my life that wasn't reflective of my family's experiences that um, I became ramped up in my politicization. And then um, I went to prison and that for me just really pushed me into um, demanding during that time that I fill myself up as much as I could and as much as the prison administration tried to keep out the books that uh, we were asking for and organizing ourselves in the prison and using the classroom to do that. Um, and we actually did, we organized ourselves reading Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Angela Davis's books weren't, were not allowed in the prison, but Golden Gulag was. And when we read Mother's Rock, which is uh, 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 in the book towards the end, when when uh, Ruthie teaches us about Mother's um, Rock in Los Angeles, who organized themselves asking the question, why does this system continue to steal so many of our black and brown children? And, and that moved us. We were politicized by the writings of the women incarcerated in Bedford Hills that we used, um, writings by Kathy Boudin, our dear, Kathy Boudin, who was a dear mentor to us, who passed away uh, yesterday. Um, it's, it's times blurring together, um, and 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 that for us, and then that that experience of incarceration and being hungry, just hungry for more knowledge and information, moved me to. In my house, growing up, the we didn't have a whole lot of TVs. We had walls and walls and walls of books. And um, the, on those books were black writers, um, everything from economists to black feminist writing. And so I became really hungry to read uh, Bell Hooks and Celeste Ware and learn more about um, women that were right here fighting in the Kambahi River Collective, um, uh, uh, Beverly Smith, and Barbara Smith and women who affected policy here in Boston. Um, and just still today, every chance I get to read more and more about black women writers, black feminist women writers, um, that is what I've been mostly absorbing and constantly still learning and not being afraid as we've heard the other panelists say, um, surrounding ourselves in collectives where we're not afraid to say, help me, or I don't understand, help me understand further what um, these thoughts are, what these lineages are. Um, and so I think it's kind of threefold for me. Thank you so much, Ms. James. I wanna also make sure that everyone listening learns about the groundbreaking work that you all are doing individually and also collectively. And Eli, if you don't mind um, me starting with you, uh, Kirsten Hash, a student organizer with HPDC, the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign, asks, what did you gain from your pen pal experience writing with incarcerated folks? And how did these relationships shape your work with Black and Pink Massachusetts? Okay, well, for anyone who doesn't know, um, Black and Big Massachusetts is an abolitionist organization in uh, that was founded here in Boston in uh, 2005. We work specifically with LGBTQ plus people and people living with HIV who are incarcerated 
or are involved and tangled in some way in the criminal legal system or are formerly incarcerated. And one of the major ways that we do that um, is through a pen pal program that asks people to write across walls, asks both sides of the walls to take some risks and make connections. Um, the idea is that or what has become very apparent to me and what I tell people when I train them on the pen pal program because the pen pal program changed my life. I'm gonna show you my background. Um, this was embroidered by my friend, Jerry, who is um, coming home after about 10 and a half years. He's coming home in July. He embroidered this from his cell in a federal prison. Um, one of about seven or eight that he was in over that course of time. And I met him just by picking up a random letter in a stack of a thousand letters and reading a story about a queer man who had been jumped by three people and severely beaten, required reconstructive surgery, um, and was in response just getting shuttled around from institution to institution each time he was um, jumped by white supremacists for being queer. Um, so just picking up that one letter, hearing that one person that made me respond like as a human being on a human level to write a human letter back um, changed everything for me. And I feel like any good that I have done or do in abolition is because of my connection with Jerry and because of the pen pal program. And something I've certainly heard Andrea say is that, you know, you don't know until you're there. Um, and this is as close as many of us will hopefully ever get to um, seeing behind the wall. Thank you so much, Eli. I just wanna open it up to our other panelists if you'd like to talk about how you individually or through the process of your work with your organizations, how do you engage with system impacted individuals and families? Andrea, you gotta take the floor. What are you doing? This is this is this is you. We're like, it's, come it's on. So, yeah. so, you know, for starters, our community doesn't stop at the prison gates. Our community is um, all of our loved ones and our people inside. And um, you know, we uh, our entire work um, as formerly incarcerated women, trans, and gender nonconforming folk is to end the incarceration of women, trans and gender nonconforming folk. Um, it's to, and unapologetically, um, just end it. And so we started that work inside. We still work um, with uh, sisters inside of every single federal prison in the country and lots of state prisons. Um, everything we do is toward that purpose. And it's um, a working along with um, people who are um, directly affected uh, um, in um, all the different ways that we define that with the family members, the loved ones, the children. Um, and so um, we work to free her, free them all. And um, uh, our three buckets of work uh, legal, we just uh, sued Muncie Prison and won. It's a women's prison in Philadelphia. Um, our, our rack of policy that we work on um, to extract people from the system, what uh, much of it we learned from RAP, releasing aging people in prison, Kathy Boudin, Laura Whitehorn, um, uh, the pieces of policy that help us get people, uh, stop the flow and help people come out on the back end. Um, but also decriminalizing uh, drugs, uh, sex work, you name it, all the things that will get us to significant and meaningful uh, decarceration of our people while we are working to close women's prisons. Uh, the Free Her campaign has launched its first six battleground states out of New England, uh, working to close those six uh, women's prisons. If anybody knows of any folks interested in that work in any of the six New England states, please let us know. Um, and our most important work, uh, 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 reimagining communities led by our team, our pilot project community led by our team, uh, uh, Sashi James and Mallory Honora, 
um, at Families for Justice of Healing in Roxbury and the incredible work that we're doing to create what different looks like, um, led by directly affected women. And so uh, that, that's the work we do. I mean, it, it, we're, just, we're, we're just submerged in it. Um, and it, it, everything we do, everything we do um, includes the input, the advice, um, the work of our sisters inside. Anything to add, Beth or Derica? Did you want to add some to your two cents really quick before you move on? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I've been very lucky to work with people who are currently enforcing and uh, currently and formerly incarcerated in a lot of different capacities because I've been a lawyer. So whether that's representing people, a very first case when I graduated law school was suing to close a jail which is which is really important I mean I'm not up to six you know like Andrea but you know I mean you know I try to do a little where I can um right now one of the organizations who I love working with is the Freedom Community Center in St. Louis it's founded by a formerly incarcerated um, organizer Mike Milton um, and I was actually thinking about Mike's work in relationship to one of the questions in the in the Q&A but what Mike does is he helps to facilitate a diversion program in St. Louis. And it's one of the only, I think, diversion programs in the country that gets people who are charged with what we consider traditionally violent offenses, right? And they go, you know, they work with Mike, they do all sorts of like services, but also political education and organizing the community. And so I, I feel very lucky to be able to work with them around political education, think about some of their campaigns, how to be in conversation, around policy changes at the local level. And so it, it really does um, depend on the context. I have like 17 jobs, um, but yeah, it, it, it really does range. <laughs> and so, so I'm always so excited to listen to the work that Andrea, um, Andrea is doing because it really captures people. You know, that's like the theory of social justice change. And it's like, there's like the people you catch before they go over the waterfall. There's the people you catch from dropping in, the people you are catching from, you know, you're throwing life vests to. And I think what's incredible about the organization is that they're not catching or helping the saving people as an organization where people are organizing along the entire like spectrum to really make change, um, like literally responding to harm, preventing harm, helping to get people out, helping to close prisons is just so impressive and so important, which is why I didn't, I don't have nothing to say. It's just that it, I just really wanted to, to share that. And last but not least, Beth, it'd be really helpful to hear from your perspective as well um, as someone who is positioned firmly within the university, um, what it's like to kind of engage knowing that you have those attachments and affiliations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I first wanted to say, imagine, imagine going to meetings where Andrea is talking <laughs> uh, all the time. That will, uh, that will lead you some really positive places. And I know we'll do a hard pitch uh, for what you can do at the end, but uh, that'll be part of it. You can listen to Andrea uh, all the time. And it's, it is um, a religious experience. Um, so I will say straddling that line between um, academia academia and abolition is super fun for me i'll say that i feel like all the time you know what we're working so hard in organizing space is to get people to listen to you right how do we get people to listen to you so that we can change their minds so that we can get them to help and support and so i'm fortunate enough to have classrooms of people who have to listen to me all the time and so it's really nice to be able to center the work of directly impacted women and create a syllabus and a course that way and guide people through an understanding of the issues within the system and then always come out at abolition and TJ. It's uh, very convenient and, um, and a really important way to also be doing the experiments of abolition, seeing what works, what connects with people, really hearing um, people's hesitations and then being able to bring that in. So bringing in, I talk about uh, FJA, Families for Justice at Healing. I talk about it all the time in there, right? I'm like, do you understand that it's just down the street? Like, you do you know the state you live in? Um, so uh, we talk about that all the time, let alone that Andrea also founded uh, the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. That's a national organization um, and we're here in Massachusetts. So I think it's really important also because then the students are hearing all the time about jobs, right? Possible jobs and how to avoid 
the jobs where you become a police officer and how to move more towards community jobs that's going to um, employment that will build up our community. Thank you. I know that another important topic um, that we wanted to dig into is kind of like what it looks like engaging with the university and university folks when doing this work. Um, and at our last convening, we talked about some of the non-negotiables that organizers might have when deciding how to engage, where to engage, and what that engagement looks like um, because of the university's extractive relationships uh, with communities and college towns that make universities like Harvard function in the first place. Um, so I really want to hear from folks, um, how do you think, well, first of all, what are some of your non-negotiables um, when working with the university? Um, and if you have any meaningful experiences that you'd like to share about that, that'd be really helpful. And then the second question, just for the sake of time, I'll throw two at you. Um, how should college students amplify the work that you as seasoned organizers are doing? Um, what does it look like for graduate students like myself, uh, student workers and university workers uh, to support abolitionist work? Okay, so I'll jump in <laughs> uh, because this is something that we have uh, struggled with. Um, and as a person who has a deep appreciation uh, for education um, and, and, and I am so privileged that I've had so much education. Um, but when it comes to the work that, when, when, when we were sitting in the prison and hearing this uptick, that was 2010. And it was because of Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, lots of other people had written about what was referred to as mass incarceration, but the way that she laid that out for us um, really drew people in um, across the country. Um, and the, it, it launched us into this uptick in dialogue around the need to end mass incarceration. So to the scathing long journalistic report that came out uh, about the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Koch brothers and the billionaires who were funding literally what became, in addition to a number of other nefarious things, gutting public education, uh, gutting any chances of universal health care, um, uh, disenfranchisement of voting rights. But um, for us, uh, being the architects of mass incarceration, we built you know, a prison every 10 days in this country from 1996 to 2008 and crammed it full of black people and poor people. And so um, when we began to organize ourselves in the prison, we slowly trickled out and wanted to have our voices heard as experts. And at the time, I was the only one that was able to come out anytime soon. I was buried in, I was in prison for two years with women who were there for 22 years by the time I got there. Um, so, uh, you know, I was given a task by them to go and raise awareness from our perspective. Um, and we were maybe sometimes invited by academia, who was at the time really expanding their uh, uh, presence in the space, in the ecosystem of, of what was termed criminal justice reform, along with a lot of large nonprofits like Vera. Um, that were researchers also, uh, but really were not centering people and, and recognizing us as experts. And we did a lot of work to, to, to demand that you're not just gonna bring us on here to hear about all the messy parts of our, our lives, that we actually have an expertise that um, can contribute significantly to creating change. Um, and um, what we came out with as an ask or as a demand really from um, academia and particularly because I came out to Massachusetts. I mean, there's a college on every corner um, with no black people in it, <laughs> none, <laughs> except you know a tiny, thank God for the individual exceptionalism of really brilliant people that managed to get into these places. Um, but for the most part, you know, and they encroach right upon our neighborhoods. Northeastern, my alma, law school alma mater has taken over Roxbury um, with very little benefit to the people that live there. Wentworth sits right up in the housing development with zero benefit to the people who live there. 
um, so our demand was, and I'll shut up, I'm talking way too long, was to um, uh, say, um, you shall not do your work, uh, continue to do your work that's outside of what we call participatory research. And just to get me out of the way, I will, um, I, I will, and that's how we lead it. You're not gonna lead it. You're gonna come, we're gonna ask you for the help when we need it. And then you're gonna come and help us do a participatory research process with all of your resources and brilliance of how to do research. And the last thing I'll just say about college students is, please don't ask us. I, every day I'm inundated and, and my, our, you know, the staff, everybody kind of fields all of these calls because we're asked to, at the last minute in the 11th hour, a grad student or an undergrad is writing a paper on whatever. Please, can we just talk to you? Can we get 30 minutes? Or, because you want to, you know, just transcribe what we're saying and then vomit it into a paper. You're invited to come in. You're invited to come in and be a part of our space. And, and you can write your own for, because now you're having a direct experience as opposed to um, trying to do it the way that so many students. So I would ask the universities, please give your students space enough to really ex explore what they, what you're ultimately going to ask them to do at the end of the semester as a final paper or some grad project um, and, and, and bring them in, bring the classroom into our spaces um, so, that, so that we can get the benefit, but also uh, they can be politicized. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So we heard a few um, very clear non-negotiables centering um, system impacted folks as the experts, recognizing that expertise, compensating that expertise, um, right? Um, we've, and other, you know, all the elements that stem from that in terms of engaging them with participatory research. Um, and also not treating folks like objects of inquiry and objects of study um, and actually encouraging students and anyone in the community who wants to be engaged to actually engage, right? Show up, um, you know, go to the rallies, sign the petitions, be at the town halls, be a presence and build relationships ultimately, right? Don't just be an outside or participant observer, uh, but actually be someone that is willing to struggle alongside others. Um, any other non-negotiables? Any other um, not, thoughts on how a, students? Yeah. Not a, this is not a non-negotiable, but it's what Andrea said in your re-articulation just made me think of what I've been experiencing in the last few years in academia with the rise of directly impacted language. Is that I'm watching universities use people who are formerly, formerly and currently incarcerated as a sword, as a shield for reform which has been interesting. So when they are inviting or making sure that people are, you know, a part of the participatory research or program, they're not representative of like abolitionists or people with more radical politics or political prisoners, right? It's like, well, like we're going to like make sure we are using these particular voices. No, 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 y'all like directly impacted people, right? No, 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 this person directly impacted our problem. So that's the energy <laughs> that is, that's happening right now that we have to be mindful of and come back and say, yeah, there are people who are in prison who have a wide range of experiences and ideas about how to approach this problem. And you're doing a disservice to the diversity of political ideas by only like using one as the representative of all the people who are incarcerated. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the expertise is important, but I've also seen people, um, their directly impacted expertise then gets used to further harmful criminalization, more incarceration, more jail building. And so it's like, well, let's talk about the spectrum of political ideas that have to be represented in these conversations, just like they would be in lots of different places. We have to fight for uh, radical and political voices to be included. It's like one thing that sort of came up for me. Second thing that came up with the students, I, I love Angie's point about getting that email to say, hey, my paper is due in three days. Can you talk to me about abolition? You know, that, that's really fun. I didn't even think about that, but I, I don't know. I don't want students to amplify my work. That is not, I am least interested in that. I am much more interested in students finding a political home to do work, 
that is so much more important to me, right? And what that means can literally range. And so when I get students who email me about a book club that they're doing, I'm so much more excited and so much more likely to respond than you need help with the paper, right? Because now what you're doing is pulling a group of people together who have a different, who have different ranges of ideas about society, who are trying to learn and struggle together towards something. That's so much more exciting to me, right? So much more important to me. Um, students who are doing pen pals, I, I have to actually find a new pen pal because my pen pal was at MCI Norfolk and he just got out after 20, you know, 20 years of prison. So I, now I have to find another pen pal because that's a political commitment that I have. It's an ethical commitment that I have. If you're a student, you can, you can be on Twitter, you can be on Facebook, you can get a pen pal. You can do something very, very simple and very concrete as a part of a longer struggle to be a part of ending incarceration. You know, you can organize to be a part of a prison divestment campaign. I am so excited about students who are fighting to get police off campus and to get their university endowments divested from fossil fuels and from prisons. You can be a part of a campaign. I know students who are trying to sue to stop their, including Harvard, trying to sue to stop universities from continuing to invest in carceral systems. So there's a full spectrum of what students can do more than just amplification, retweeting, liking, sharing, subscribing. That stuff is cool, but we're not gonna like, share, subscribe ourselves out of a prison industrial complex. We're not gonna like, share, subscribe ourselves into an abolitionist future. Like that's just not gonna happen. And so so whatever sort of time you have to sort of be socialized to do that, try to think of a concrete way to be a part of a larger struggle or a larger organization or a small one to figure out how you can play a specific role to dismantle the system. Yeah, and I would say that, um, you know, within Black and Big Massachusetts, we actually have a problem of too many white college educated, non directly affected people wanting to be involved and not matching the demographics of the people that we have inside and the people that we have the deepest commitments to and are formerly incarcerated members. And what I see um, among people who you know fit that, which includes me, I went to what I thought were very good schools, but it turns out they were just white and expensive schools. And I didn't figure that out for a really long time. Um, we can come into this work with a real lack of humility. Um, and I think that that can feed into the extraction that Andrea described of trying to pull out the worst things that have happened to people um, and not giving them anything back for it. Um, so something that I also look for is, are they involved for more than just a paper? Are they involved for more than just a semester? Are they gonna, and, and like for pen pals, for example, that's not volunteering. That is an intentional relationship and commitment that you are making to another human being to include them in your life. And that can't just be a semester for me. <laughs> we need more than three months to, to really make a connection with a human being. Um, so really just, and I would say, just know that reading a book means nothing. You know, the rules mean nothing. You can memorize them, but they're never going to make sense. Um, and that's just a little bit of that humility thing. All right, I know we can I know we can stay on this topic for many more minutes, but I want to make sure we get to our great audience questions. But before we do that, um, what are some concrete ways that people can um, figure out how to do this work better? Are there um, I know, Beth, I think you just dropped something in the chat. Do you guys want to vocalize some of the things that people can engage with in the next coming weeks or months? Sure, absolutely. So I just dropped in the chat um, a link that is um, shows events that are happening this Mother's Day weekend. This is organized um, by Families for Justice's Healing, specifically Sashi, who I believe is here. Hi, Sashi. <laughs> um, organized a lot of these uh, different events um, in ways that you can get involved. And so this is like, if you're like, oh, I don't know, but I'm like, here, here is this weekend, this moment, right? I was nervous at first too. And I love um, Eli's point about humility because it's like, you come in and no matter how great you think you are, nervous is good because it keeps you humble. And then you figure out where you're going to fit in. Um, and so the link that I provided in the chat after um, Andrew's super important organizational links um, gives some different options. How comfortable are you? And, and the, one of the great ideas that Sashi had was for a women's canteen. Um, I want to really promote that. So that's um, 
a way that we can uh, get some money on the books for women um, over the Mother's Day weekend, which is a particularly difficult weekend, um, of course, in prison. And so it's super important to tune into those events that uh, Families for Justice is Healing is putting together. And then you get to meet people in person a little bit, and then that grows the comfort level. But there's online stuff there too, if you don't want to meet in person. Thank you, Beth. I can just quickly say really quick, um, thank you, Beth, for lifting up uh, the local work here in Roxbury at FJA, always something happening because we are in a fight to make sure that we permanently derail uh, our proposal to build a new women's prison here in Massachusetts uh, while we are working with PNP on uh, closing <laughs> the, the, the women's prison at Framingham. But that work is part of a larger body of work uh, that is led by uh, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women around this country under what we call the Free Her Campaign. And so our first six battleground states that we are currently in are the New England states. The six states in New England are geographically proximate to each other. Our purpose is to build a loud drumbeat about ending incarceration of women and girls. And their, their women's prisons in each of those states have the smallest incarcerate, the lowest incarceration populations of women in the country, except for a couple of Midwest states that are outliers. So we, we, we've got it, we can. We can, with 139 state incarcerated women in Massachusetts, we need to just stop this. We need to stop this nonsense of having a women's prison here. There are 89 women's, women incarcerated in this tiny building that they call a women's prison in Burlington, Vermont. These are the things that we are working on currently through the Free Her campaign. The last thing I'll say is that's really important to us is our basic income guarantee. We were asked to consult with a hundred mayors campaign. We came back from that and said, this is great, but we're gonna do this. We don't think that city or state administrations that change all the time um, should be uh, doing this. And that we wanna take care of our movement family coming out of prisons ourselves. So this year we provide $500 a month to 22 formerly incarcerated women, but four of those women are currently incarcerated. And those four women will continue to receive their basic income guarantee until they come home. And so these are just some of the ways. If you live in the New England states or know people who do, who will get involved in the campaign uh, to close these women's prisons, please get in touch with us. Let us know either at FJA or the National Council. Um, this is the center of our work right now the first six uh, battleground states. It's a distributed organizing campaign. So that means that there's something that everybody could do. So thank you for this opportunity and to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so have, I'll also oh, make, sorry, I'll make a quick plug for um, some legislation that Black and Pink Massachusetts has pending. Um, right now the rights act it has five little parts and basically what it does is improve conditions of confinement for incarcerated lgbtq people and people living with hiv it includes things like not putting people in solitary for non-sexual touch like a hug or touching someone's head which has happened to our members um, it includes having keep on person status for HIV medication so you can take it at the correct time and the correct dosage so that you don't become um, transmissible again, which happened to one of our members because their medication was so badly mismanaged. Um, and it includes things like the ability to celebrate pride. And I thought that amongst some of the other things that people were asking for, that surprised me initially because it's not about life and death the way that some others are, but in a way it is. It's about seeing your self-reflected and important and knowing that you have a culture, a lineage, a history, and a place where you belong. Um, so there's a link in the, in the chat about that. And also just to get a plug for being a pen pal. Awesome. Wanted to make sure you guys had time to drop all of those because those are great bits of information that everyone needs to follow up on in the chat. Um, unfortunately, I know we won't be able to get to everyone's audience question. We've only got about 20 minutes left, but I did want to make sure that we started off with this one um, from Deborah Cooper. Criminalizing reproductive rights is obviously an abolition issue. How do we call in the, and I don't want to say the expletive word, people to take on this work? <laughs> Uh, 
I, yeah, I was so distracted, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning of this panel, thinking about the fight that's happening. I'm in DC right now, the fight that's happening down the street, dozens and dozens of people outside of the Supreme Court who are, you know, screaming, shouting, demanding that the Supreme Court does not overturn Roe v. Wade, given the leak that happened yesterday. And so it's just, I mean, the phone calls, there's just actions that were planned for other campaigns that are being shifted to then be responsive to what's happening. And I think that I would start, at least with my own sense of humility, that I don't think that they are the only people who need to be called in, that any one of these fights, these Supreme Court decisions, policy changes, is just gonna require all of us. And even though criminalization of reproductive justice or reproductive rights is an abolition issue. I don't think a lot of people are potentially swayed by that because I would imagine there was a Venn diagram. The people who were excited about um, a particular political candidate and the people who are against abolition, there's probably a huge shared circle in the middle. Right, so I don't know if they would be particularly swayed by that, but I do think that there is a role for all of us to play around each of these fights. And I'm really excited that people just didn't wait to or donate a lot of money to a giant legal organization to go fight this in court. I'm happy that people are showing up outside, they're making phone calls, they're donating to grassroots organizations who are doing advocacy work, policy work, who are funding people who are getting reproductive justice and care. And so I think it's, it's yeah, I don't, I don't know, calling in is, is tough, or at least that's just not, I don't find myself in community with a lot of people who wore those hats, who went to DC for that purpose. Um, the people who I tend to be in community with, you know, I think about my mom, my siblings, you know, a lot of working class Black women in our family who have various views on abortion, who have various views on reproductive justice rights. Um, and so what is it going to take for me to have conversations with them and say, hey, you know, this is wrong. This is how this may impact you. This is how it's impacting other people. You know, what do you think about it? What do you think we should do about it? And how do we have those conversations with humility and integrity and excitement in a way that's not trying to convert people to do what we think that they should do, but to really struggle alongside them to figure out how can we fight together? And then whereas our shared values, where our shared goals, whereas our shared dreams for the kind of society that we deserve, and then using it as a starting place to have conversations and then to organize. Any other thoughts on reproductive rights as abolitionist work? Yeah, so, and, and yes to all that that's happening right now, right, in real time. But I also wanna bring into this space, part of reproductive rights is, you know, very basic tenets is, you know, the right to have a child, the right to not have a child. When you incarcerate, I, I had my last child at 45. My son um, was uh, going on six months old when I went to prison. And when I got to prison, um, the women, many of the women, I was in federal prison. And so many of the women were serving these outrageously long sentences and had not had an opportunity to have children before they went to prison. And so we don't often think about this as a part of reproductive rights, but our policies in the criminal legal system, our policies that strip people of the right to be parents if they choose to do that. Um, and, and so, you know, we, I just always encourage us to expand our thinking around reproductive rights to thinking about how the criminal legal system does more than just incarcerate people. It affects our lives so greatly in terms of our ability to exercise our reproductive rights. All right. So on a related note, and this kind of, I think, goes to what you were speaking to earlier, Derica, about like how do we develop shared understandings um, when pushing for abolitionist visions for very complex, hairy, complicated issues. Um, this um, audience member asks, how can we respond to people who don't see movement work, whether it be BLM, abortion rights, or just anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist anti work more generally, as abolition work? 
um, how do we get folks to kind of see it as a part of this larger umbrella vision rather than just pursuing their own kind of single issue um, challenges without embracing abolitionist values. I think I would want a little bit more information about that question because I don't see any of those things as inherently abolitionist, right? I actually find myself <laughs> fighting with a lot of socialists around abolition, right? Because they're, they're on board with being anti-capitalist and now on board with abolishing police and prisons, right? And so uh, there, there are people who I know who are in BLM organizations. Some of them are okay with fighting for what I would call carceral responses to harm. Some of them are not. And so I don't think any, which is why earlier I really tried to emphasize, and I think everyone here too, about the importance of this framework being rooted in struggle and in community. I think that like the argument um, Andrea just made, about seeing the alignment between reproductive justice and abolition. It's an important argument and intervention to make because it's not inherent that there are people who I take to be reproductive rights scholars who would not make that connection, right? That's why we, when I think about um, um, the, the debates around like carceral feminism, right? It's like, we need people to make these sort of interventions like in scholarship, in art, and our organizing literally across the board because I don't take any of these things for granted. A lot of these are neutral terms and we're fighting to contest and, and claim ownership to their meaning to inform the kind of work that we do. And so I think that there is a lot of value in trying to win people over and say, hey, I noticed for this particular campaign, you know, what is the ultimate goal? Are you, are you interested in diversifying the Supreme Court because you're gonna, it's gonna lead to a more just society, right? Is, like, is, is, that like, is that why you think diversity is important? Or do, is, is it gonna lead to less harm? Or do you think it's gonna stop reproductive rights from being taken away? Like, what, like what's your excitement about that? Or are you interested in like, questioning the role of courts altogether? But it's not enough to see one of these like grand ways, grand paradigms of looking at the world and saying, you know, this is enough, which is why I really think it's important when people are collapsing or say, look, abolition is cool. We also need disability justice. We also need to understand colonialism and indigenous resistance. We need to understand these traditions um, alongside abolition as a framework, because just one of them is not going to be enough to do the kind of work that we need to do. Building off of that, and this is kind of you know expanding beyond just conversations with other organizers and other people who are already, already politically active, and really thinking about kind of just everyday folks who are dealing with harms and all sorts of just you know issues that we as human beings experience. Um, this audience member is wondering um, for folks who are you know around the neighborhood dealing with their car being broken into or having someone steal something from them at gunpoint. Um, how do we talk to them about abolition in a meaningful way um, and get them to understand how abolitionist frameworks and organizing through them um, is trying to address these problems and not just defund the police and shut things down? Oh, I can say something quickly about that as, as somebody who's doing on the ground work like that. Um, so again, I keep going back to the phrase that we refer to all the time, uh, what different looks like. And one of the things that we asked in this long, years long listening tour that we did in these neighborhoods and communities, including our own here in Roxbury, was, you know, what brings you joy? In addition to all the other questions, the typical questions, what brings you joy? And, um, you know, there are a whole lot of black folk in my neighborhood who are demanding more police. Um, but, and, and acknowledging because we, in our neighborhoods, we have, we have been the ones, there's, there's no bright line. It's not like there's any like, oh, you over here, you, you caused harm and you over here, you were the victim of harm. It's like this, you know, this whole convergence, right? And so, um, as Mariam Kaba refers to it as there are no perfect victims, right? And so when we have conversations that first allow people to talk about how they define harm, it helps us to then acknowledge 
their pain, their trauma, their feelings around what harm looks like for them. But then it also helps us to begin the conversation about, well, what does different look like? And okay, if that's what different looks like, we know for sure that the system that has been in place for all of these decades, that hasn't changed anything. We've had a gang unit running up and down in our neighborhood, you know, to a tune of $190 million with all the other special police programs. We just lost four black men in the past two weeks, right? These, th these don't work. And so what we know for sure is that police, prosecutors, you know, prisons, courts, and prisons don't create thriving communities, right? Healthy people, thriving people create public safety for a lack of a better term. And how do we, how do we get there? So helping people to recognize what we know for sure is a failed system. What, what hasn't brought you more comfort um, in your home, in, in these communities? Um, and where we can go, what can we do? And we've got some pretty good uh, work that's going on in reimagining communities that are building thriving, healthy communities that will get us to a place where less harm is caused. Yeah, absolutely. To build on that, um, really focusing in on what Andrew was talking about, what did you need when that happened? So what I would say to directly address the question, what do you say to these people in the comments? Um, well, what did you need when that happened? You know, did you need um, to feel safe in your home? And, and I don't think a prison's doing that for you, right? Did you need someone to walk you from here to there for a week? Well, the criminal legal system is not going to offer that to you. Community organizing can offer that to you. Strong communities can offer you safety. Um, strong communities can offer you financial compensation so that you can go to therapy, right? And that's not going to be offered to you in the criminal legal system. Uh, I worked for four years as a rape crisis counselor. And that is also what really finished punishing me to abolition because every single rape victim that I worked with who went into the system ended up more miserable than every rape victim who didn't, right? Like, so when we think that like, especially the murderers and rapists argument, right? That we need prisons for those purposes. Well, the rapists aren't there. And, uh, and that what actually people need, what rape victims, what they need is not terrible interactions with the police and the criminal legal system that make everything worse, right? And so then, trying to pull people out of the fantasy of what prison could do, um, like what Andrew is saying, that um, the fantasy of what that would feel like, what safety would feel like, and realizing that this is a complete failure, and what else could we do, and then using those funds that we use for this complete failure to build what different looks like, and trying to get more and more of those funds is what's super exciting about also the work that um, we do with UPJA. I know we're creeping into our time and I want to make sure we still have time for closing comments from each of you. So this will be our last audience question, but thank you so much listeners for submitting these really thoughtful and thought provoking um, um, pieces of discussion. Um, this audience member asked, do, do you all have any thoughts on how organizers working to get cops off campus can be in solidarity with other abolitionist movements and avoid the harmful extractive dynamics that Ms. James named earlier? Ask, I think you should ask how I, the, the people who you are, the organizations you're looking to be in solidarity with, I think you should ask them this question. Um, once you get an answer, assess whether you or the people you're working with can abide by that and, you know, and then whatever you commit to, to honor that commitment. I think Derricka raises the most important point, again, is to, is to um, come into community with folks who are doing the work, doing this work, and can come into community, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of the questions you have, you'll be part of a community now, uh, 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 doing and thinking about this work, and a lot of the questions will come about from collective perspective like about how to do these things. Um, yeah. 
Eli or Beth, anything to add? All right. Well, with that, we'll move into closing comments. Um, what is one thing that you want folks who are still hanging on and listening to us right now to walk away with in order to advance abolition work right here in Boston, but also elsewhere? Ms. James, is it, is it okay if we start with you? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, support our work, you know? Um, and 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 what there's lots of ways to do it. You can you can donate to our organizations, particularly Families for Justice as Healing. You can uh, come in and be a part of the work um, itself. Uh, but uh, uh, that would that would really be my ask um, to come in. Uh, we're in a we're in a fight right now. Uh, we're in a fight to stop a new women's prison from being built. Um, we're not alone. Uh, they just dropped an RFP in Vermont. So we're in these six New England states waging a battle against systems that are unrelenting um, and non-transparent um, and cruel. And so we're asking you to please come in and join us um, in doing that. Um, lots and lots of ways to do that. So thank you. Eli, I know you just dropped a link in the chat. Do you want to uplift what you posted? Yeah, I mean, we're doing all sorts of work in the community of Black and Pink, Massachusetts. We are advancing towards opening our own home for formerly incarcerated trans people, people who are coming directly out of prison and jail, people that we cannot place in emergency housing because of the transphobic nature of the housing. It's not safe and they won't take them, um, particularly trans women. Um, so any support that you can give helps us support that house, helps us run our work, helps us buy stamps. Um, and I'm also gonna drop just a huge list um, of the first Boston orgs that are doing kind of either explicitly abolitionist or abolitionist adjacent work. Um, I left people off and I'm so sorry. And also a couple of folks out in, a couple of orgs out in Western Mass that I know are doing really good work. And that um, if you're out there, please email me. I'm so sorry, <laughs> like, we need to connect. Uh, we really need to expand outside of Boston. Um, so just, and like Andrea said, get involved, find a way to get involved. Email me, find a way to get involved. Thank you, Eli. Beth, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you so much. So I just wanna echo the getting involved part, right? And say again, maybe it sounds scary. You've never done anything like that. That's true for everyone in organizing, right? Everyone's had that moment. So when is your moment gonna be? One of my favorite conversations that we have in People Not Prisons is assessing your capacity and what your unique skills are, what you can bring, but then also what you wanna learn. What do you have no idea about, right? Cause this is a space where people will teach you what you need to know. And I love when Andrea earlier was talking about that uh, teacher learner and the dynamic of that, that plays out all the time. So I promise whoever's listening to this, wherever you are, there is space for you in the movement. We can't wait to have you. Let's get involved. I'll send the link again um, for the weekend's action. Thank you, Beth. And last, but certainly not least, Derica. Yes, listen to all of these people. They are all right, listen to them. Um, I think that the most important thing I, I'm feeling right now, especially with students, um, is to realize that abolition is, is, is not just an identity. Um, and so I'm hoping that people who are, you know, paying attention to this conversation, I hope what you gather from, so what many of us have said is that to really be patient and to be in, in study and in struggle with, you know, yourself and with people around you. Um, for people who are curious or even skeptical about what this abolition stuff is or means, to be patient and to be inviting, to be curious, to struggle alongside them, to make our movement bigger. And to the people who are who have the power to know what we're what we mean when we say abolish the police, the people who are repressive, the people who are harmful, to be relentless against them, right? You're, Relentlessness is not towards people who don't understand, who are asking questions. Even if they're in bad faith, you can choose to engage and not to engage. But the people who you should be relentless against are the people who have the power to, to further harm. And by harm, I don't just mean interpersonal harm. I mean, people who are creating systemic structures of, of harm that then 
create interpersonal harm, right? And so that that's that's so important. But the conversation that you were having with someone, you may not convert them, you may not try to win them over. It took me five years to have the same kinds of conversations with people in my family before they got to the part where they were like, oh, so, okay, we, we get it now. Five years, five years, right? This is not back and forth on social media. This is, you know, how do I like, get someone to understand in one conversation? Right. And so I, I just hope that people give themselves the discipline, the rigor and the patience to understand this is a lifelong sets of conversations and habits and, that we need to develop in order um, to, to make our fight stronger. Thank you so much. We have reached the end of our time together this afternoon. Before folks log off, I've got two more in organizations that we want to put on everyone's radar, uh, Unity Circles and Cambridge Heart. Unity Circles, a Boston-based nonprofit, is doing groundbreaking work through their transformative justice practitioner program and community accountability and harm circle processes with Boston-based youth at the helm of leadership and program operations. To learn more about Unity Circles, please visit their website link in the chat. On their website, you can also donate directly to Unity Circles to help grow their ongoing work. The second organization is Cambridge Heart, which stands for Holistic Emergency Alternative Response Team. This is a brand new community safety program, also rooted in transformative justice frameworks that responds to public and private crises, engages in conflict resolution processes, and coordinates mutual aid to support material needs for folks living here right in Cambridge. To learn more about Cambridge Heart, please check out their website and Instagram page, excuse me, which should also be copied in the chat. And if you are a Cambridge resident, before you log off today, make sure to sign the petition to allocate funds to Cambridge Hearts Alternative Public Safety Program, which of course, as you may have guessed, will be available in that chat. Um, we thank each and every one of you for tuning in with us. Thank you to our co-sponsors and thought partners for making this convening possible. And thank you to our phenomenal panelists for being present and sharing your wisdom with us today. All of us with the Abolition Collaboratory wish all of you a wonderful rest of your afternoon.